This is archaeological site number 12 HR 304 in Harrison County, Indiana, also known as Swan's Landing. This is one of the most uh, famous sites in Indiana. The site was discovered probably in the late 60s or early 70s by collectors who started finding tons of pine tree points washing out on the beach where I'm standing and then they realized that there was a seam of pine tree points up in the bank so they began digging them out. Thousands of beautiful pine tree points were dug out of this site before archaeologists got involved. The river was washing the site out. You see there's a lot of trees here now, but in the 70s, that was not the case. This was just a bare open bank and the bank was collapsing and the guys who dug in there, actually it was not illegal at the time and they actually kind of saved part of the site because everything they dug out would have been lost to the river. Also, to their credit, they told archeologists about it. And in 1984, I believe early 80s, Ed Smith from Indiana University came down and conducted an excavation down here. Uh, Ed dug it again in 1994 and I was fortunate enough to be along on that dig. But this site is just fabulous for the uh, early archaic pine tree points which I'm going to talk about a little bit more here in a minute. And I'm standing on the beach of the pine tree site. Um, you can see the bank up there. When I dug in 1994, the original excavation was near the face of this bank, really near the edge, but we went back in another 20 or 30 yards further and found a continuation of the pine tree seam and that's where we dug at. I am standing on the beach because I no longer have permission to go up on the site. I'm down here on the beach where uh, people can walk but if I were to climb up on that bank I would be trespassing. It's owned by a cement company. I'm not going to go up there and trespass. I obviously have permission from them back in the 90s when I worked here and then also personally at that time but that's been a long long time ago almost 30 years ago so my permission is probably no longer valid but I'm going to tell you a little more about this site. I first came to this site in 1981 or 82 when I was a boy and uh, there were guys digging at the time and it was very dangerous. They were actually tunneling in and it looked like the, uh, their, their uh, hose could collapse on them at any time. And in fact there was a guy there who had a cast and his arm was blue where that had happened to him and he had had the wall collapse on him and break his arm just a week or two earlier. I found out later that man was Art Gerber who was one of the most well-known collectors in the Midwest, uh, somewhat notorious of a guy, but a very interesting guy. And uh, the dangerous pits did not seem to be slowing Art down a bit. He and the other guys were in there digging, but we did not. We just kind of uh, walked around and looked at what they were doing. They showed us some of the points they dug out, which were the most incredible things I think I'd ever seen in my life. That's part of what inspired me to go into archaeology, seeing the fine craftsmanship on these pine tree points. And I still have some uh, chert adzes and other tools that the guys didn't want. They were after the really nice pine tree points, and they were throwing the other artifacts out. Uh, you can see there's a nice biface of Wyandotte chert, an incredibly well-made broken biface, and then a couple chert adzes. Uh, at this site and also at the Farnsley site up at the uh, Caesars Casino, the adzes were made of lower grade material, probably because of the purpose. And you can see there's a polish all along the, uh, the edge of this adze where it's been used. And the really high grade chert, like the Wyandotte and the Good Mall draw, probably would not have held up to this. So they use really poor grade, almost limestone-like chert. As you can see, this one also has some polish on the edges where it was used and it's also a very low grade a uh, very tough chert, so it was being used obviously for a different purpose than the uh, than the pine tree points, which were used for hunting and slicing. Uh, these things were not used for slicing; they're more likely used for prying and digging and wedging and things like that. So I did get some of the artifacts that they discarded out of here when I was a boy, and it just really intrigued me. Little did I know, in another ten or twelve years, I'd be down here with Ed Smith uh, doing a, conducting a professional excavation on this site. A lot of people refer to this site as a pine tree site because so many pine tree points came out of it. They're part of the uh, Kirk cluster of points. The original pine tree site though is in Alabama. This site is multi-component. There are other things here. These are three points from the Swan's Landing site that are not pine trees or Kirk's necessarily. The one on the left is a paleo point. It is ground down the left side there and ground around the base, but you can see it's broken, the tip's broken off and the right hand side as we're looking at it is broken off. But it is uh, fluted, it has a short flute in it. Let me see, I've got uh, super glue all over my hand, so forgive that, but you can see the flute going down it. 
This next point is probably a Kirk variant. It's not a classic pine tree or a classic Kirk, but given that it's serrated and the way it's built, it is probably some variation of a Kirk, uh, but it's not really classifiable as a, it's not definitely not a pine tree. And then finally, a St. Charles or dovetail point. This is a really small St. Charles. It's only a couple inches long, but the base is heavily ground and it's just a class that's beveled, um, really well made little point. You can see the bevel if I pick it up like that. But uh, just a neat little point. But anyway, these are three points that were found on the Swan's Landing site that are not pine trees and are not classic Kirk variants, but they are all very old. These were all found on the surface uh, of the site. These weren't dug, but it shows that it is a multi-component site. These are all made of Wyandotte chert and they're all very old pieces. Dr. Ed Smith speculated that this site was, uh, the purpose of this site was to just crank out a bunch of pine trees to retool them, maybe for trade or just for one's personal toolkit. But this site seemed to be devoted almost entirely to just manufacturing those fabulously well-made pine tree points. The reason this site was selected probably was in its, it had close proximity in the hills back behind it to uh, outcrops of Wyandotte chert or hornstone, which is a uh, very high grade material and almost all of the points that came off of this site were made of this material. A lot of crazy things happened uh, at the dig in 1994. Um, it was just starting to ramp up the craziness when I, uh, when I left. I went uh, elk hunting in Colorado for a couple weeks in the middle of September, but uh, people were messing with us. We are digging down here. I don't know why. I don't know if it was collectors that thought we were uh, messing their site up or if it was just people out looking to cause trouble. I really don't know why, but they started messing with our stuff, moving around, doing things. And apparently after I left, uh, people were shooting over the heads of the archeologists from the Kentucky side of the river. Uh, we got the local uh, conservation officer for Harrison County involved. I missed all that excitement. Uh, the second dig did not yield near as much as the first dig. I really thought it was gonna be fantastic and we'd find all these beautiful, perfect pine tree points. But we mainly just found uh, flakes of debitage, which is waste chert flakes from making points. And we found a few broken pine trees, but I don't recall that we found any absolutely perfect ones on that second dig in 94. But that's okay, because in archeology, span you're trying to get information and learn a little bit more about the site that was previously unknown. So it was a successful excavation, despite not finding a lot of really cool looking artifacts. I do wanna uh, step out of uh, being scientific and, and scholarly here and just tell one story that happened because it's so funny. When we did this dig down here, uh, I had a little John boat and we stayed in Corridan, Indiana at a, at a little hotel and I would chain my boat to the light post every night. Every morning I would get up before everybody else and I had my recurve bow and arrow and I would come down along the river and hunt squirrels and whatnot. I had permission in a couple places and then there's also some state owned land that was legal to hunt. And so anyway, one day I came down here and we had a porta potty that we brought in for the dig. and. I had on like, a, I looked like Rambo. I had on like a, a sleeveless camo vest. I had a big Rambo knife. I had my bow and I had a black bandana on. And when I walked up to the porta potty, there's about a six foot long black snake lying across the front of it. And I thought, well, I better get that out of here before everybody else shows up. So I went to try to get a hold of the snake and it disappeared under the porta potty. I wasn't sure if it went in or behind the porta potty. So I went behind the porta potty and I was looking back in the weeds for the snake. And meanwhile, a man and a woman came down the, uh, the dead end road where the site's located. And I could hear the woman say, oh, look, they put a porta potty for everybody. She thought it was just for the public, I guess, who was out walking and enjoying themselves, use the porta potty. So I'm behind there and I look and I see the couple getting closer. And I was afraid, you know, I didn't find the snake behind the porta potty. I was afraid the snake was in the porta potty and the lady was going to use the porta potty. So I'm behind the porta potty. Imagine them thinking there's nobody within, you know, 500 miles of them. They're down here like I am right now out in God's country. And she steps around and just as she reaches to open the door to the porta potty, I jumped out from behind. I said, don't go in there. And her and her husband or boyfriend or whoever it was both jumped about 20 feet straight back, scared the crap out of them, which I can understand. But uh, I said, there's a big snake in there. And then they just kind of nervously started laughing. We all had a good chuckle out of it. But I guess I just scared the living bejesus out of them when I jumped out of there with my big knife and my bandana and all that stuff. But uh, that's just a little funny side story that I remember from my times down here at Swan's Landing. Contrary to some reports I've read about the looting that went on here where they said the guys brought in heavy equipment like backhoes, that's not the case. They mainly uh, dug with shovels. A couple of them got a, a water pump and blasted the bank with like kind of like a water cannon. 
to bring the artifacts out. And some of them just dug with pocket knives. Uh, a couple of the guys told me that the one of the seams was so shallow you could just dig down a few inches with a pocket knife and pull out the pine trees. Now when, uh, when Ed, he found that uh, not only were there the shallow points, but this side extended down over six meters, three to six meters in some places, which is dang near 20 feet. So it's a very deeply buried site. Most of the site's gone now. But like I said, in 94, we dug a little horizon that was further back, but most of the main seam of pine trees that all the guys found the thousands of beautiful points out of, that's gone. Um, there's, there's very little remnants. I'm sure maybe once in a blue moon, one might wash out on this beach, but uh, there's not much coming out now. And the site has kind of repaired itself. The trees have grown back in. It looks totally different. Even at 94, the bank was completely bare and there was chert lying all over the place. And now you see it's trees and there's all kinds of debris from the flood. So this side is not being destroyed like it once was, or at least not nearly as rapidly. Uh, the river has kind of changed course a bit and it's not cutting in this bank near like it did 30 or 40 years ago. I'm just winging this. I hadn't really thought it out. I just wanted to talk about this site. It's such an important site. And I'm going to tell more about it when I get back home and when I can think it out a little bit more. But I'm just kind of winging this part out in the field right now. But I just wanted to show you the site. It's just beautiful down here. Uh, beautiful scenery. You can see behind me, in front of me, and all around. It's easy to see why people would like to be here. And then also with the chert resource, if you were living eight or 10,000 years ago, that would be one of the most valuable resources you could find. And it outcrops right around here. So just a, and you know, and you're on the river, which is a major transportation route. So it's a really important site. This was the most important pine tree site until the mid to late 90s when upriver, probably 25 miles, the uh, Caesars Casino was gonna go in and Indiana State excavated a site there that had way more information than this site did because it hadn't been looted and the river hadn't cut into it yet. And I'm gonna talk about that site in a moment when I talk about this site and kind of compare them. The major difference between the two sites is most of the points down there were made of Muldraw Church which outcrops down that way, whereas they were made out of Wyandotte chert or hornstone down here. Now that I'm back home, I'm gonna give some more specific details about the Swan's Landing site and what could be considered its sister site, the James Farnsley site. We've already discussed and visited Swan's Landing, which was excavated by Indiana University and listed on the National Register of Historic Places on April 2nd, 1987. Also in Harrison County, Indiana, approximately 20 miles overland to the northeast, or 40 miles upstream by river, is site number 12 HR 320, the James Farnsley site. This site was excavated beginning in the late 1990s in preparation for the construction of the Caesars Riverboat Casino. The Farnsley site was excavated by Indiana State University, led by Russ Stafford and Mark Canton. Uh, of note, archaeologists Canton and Steve Mokus each worked on the excavations of both Swan's Landing and the James Farnsley site, so they had experience on both of these pine tree sites. Both of these sites had deeply buried kerf points up to five or six meters deep. Both sites were multi-component sites, which meant they had artifacts from various time periods. They had uh, other completely different time periods and other early archaic components. They had points such as Thebes Cluster and large side notch cluster points. Both sites were most renowned for their finely crafted pine tree points. Pine trees are point variants within the Kirk Cluster, which also includes types such as Charleston, Palmer, and Stillwell points. Pine trees are long and slender, usually with long barbs, pronounced tips, deep serrations when they're resharpened, and thinned and heavily ground bases. As I mentioned earlier, pine tree points are some of the most beautiful points that were ever made, and they're very wicked looking with their serrations. Pine tree points can be created by resharpening large kirk points, but there's also a lot of evidence that they are a distinct point type, created uniquely from the beginning, rather than merely being a result from resharpening the large kirks. At the Farmsley site, pine tree technology was exclusive and appears to be derived from earlier Dalton technology. The inhabitants of Swan's Landing almost exclusively used Wyandotte chert to make their pine tree points, but those at Farnsley most commonly used Muldraw chert, along with significant amounts of Allen's Creek, Wyandotte, and some other uh, lesser amounts of other varieties of cherts. This was due to the immediate proximity of each site to outcrops of the various chert types. Swan's was near a Wyandotte outcrop, so that's what they used. Farnsley was near a Muldraw outcrop, so that's what they mainly used. Um, at Farnsley, scientists divided the Kirks into four types, Kirk large points, Kirk small points, pine tree points, and still well points. Um, interestingly, the still wells were found in a layer distinct from the other Kirk types, which were all intermingled. So there was something unique going on with the still wells. 
Over 2,100 Kirk points were recovered from Farnsley, an astounding number that surpassed the number of Kirk points recovered from all other major pine tree point sites combined. Um, although the excavations at Swan's Landing only produced a small fraction of this number, it's likely that the total number recovered by collectors from Swan's, based on my personal observations and what I've seen in private collections, rivaled that from Farnsley. There were hundreds if not thousands of points collected from the beach of that site and dug out of there. Um, you have to ask questions, you know, why were these sites here and how were they used? Imagine 9,000 years ago, the stillness of a foggy sunrise along the majestic Ohio, pierced by the hollow reverberation of the striking of antler billets against stone, and the high-pitched note of the stone flakes falling to the ground, as people sat around small beds of hot coals of dying fires in the early morning light, and created the tools upon which their very survival depended. Were these people elite specialists of their craft? Or did all people at that time create these tools? Did one group control this site and the stone resources found nearby, or was this just a well-known spot, a type of community property where anyone who needed to make stone tools could stop when they needed to create something and make what they needed? Did people fight over this location? Did they pay some type of a fee to use this location, or was it equally accessible to everybody? Did lone travelers just stop here while they're out hunting to make tools, or were there huge gatherings at regular intervals, kind of like modern-day rendezvous and nap-ins? Did most people just visit for a few hours to make a point or two, or did they live here for extended periods? Did specialists stay at this location all the time and create tools for other people who passed through and traded various goods for their stone tools? How many more similar spots like this might exist buried under meters of alluvial silt along the Ohio River? These are just a few of the abundance of questions generated by the existence of such intriguing archaeological sites as Swans and Farnsley. Well, to try to answer those questions, Swans seemed to be a single-purpose site devoted to manufacturing stone tools and refurbishing stone tool kits, according to Ed Smith. Huge amounts of lithic debris and pine tree points found in all stages of use suggest the creation of new points and the discarding of points in various stages of their useful lives to be replaced with new points. What is not known is how much of Swans Landing was destroyed by digging and erosion and what that missing portion of the site might have told us about its purpose. Farnsley seemed to have evidence of a wider array of activities in Swans, though there were many similarities in site function during the Kirk occupation. They were making tons of these uh, pine tree and Kirk points at both places, and there was chert debitage everywhere. Perhaps the most notable finding at Farnsley was that the site usage changed throughout the early archaic period, with sites associated with early side notch cluster points having different functions than sites associated with Thebes cluster points, and sites from both of those periods having functions differing from those of the sites associated with Kirk cluster points. Of course, we really don't know for sure. We can only speculate. So how long ago do people make all these fabulous Kirk points? Radiocarbon dates from Swan's Landing range from 6,700 to 14,300 years ago. They were all over the place, um, and Smith determined that they were most likely contaminated and probably very inaccurate, so they were not reliable at all. At Farnsley, the dates for the Kirk points range from 8,700 to 9,400 years ago and seem to be more reliable. To think that these stone points were made 9,000 years ago is uh, kind of mind-boggling and breathtaking. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little visit to the Swan's Landing site and my stories about my time working there and our examination of it in the nearby Farnsley site. Hopefully soon I'll be back with another video that kind of links us uh, through artifacts and through the natural world to the, across the vast expanses of time to the cultures that lived thousands of years before us. And uh, until then, good luck.